I'm Marco Giordano, and this is SEO in 2023, Additional Insights. Marco, what's your additional insight for SEO in 2023? So basically cutting costs and unnecessary processes that may affect your website or your agency, for instance, because I usually noticed that a lot of them, especially enterprise uh, websites and so on, are based on a stack that doesn't have synergy or it's just, you know, a sum of tools. For instance, if you are not spending much time for some technical tasks, right, it's unnecessary to pay or to spend more time in terms of opportunity on some, you know, activities. So it's more in terms of efficiency. Another example I noticed is that for some websites, like if you have a small portfolio or even if you're an agency and maybe technical SEO isn't your focus or it is your focus, but not in a predominant way, you can even cut more you know, on some some of these tasks that do not add value. Example, fixing meta descriptions. It's, it's one of these cases where there is almost no additional value for a lot of websites. And instead, investing more time into those activities where the ROI or the value for the client, for the customer, or even your website is higher. For instance, labeling your data. Or I, another example is, you know, when you have to produce a dashboard or something, a lot of people try to spend a lot of resources into these tools that help you gather some data. And maybe you don't need this data because they are hard to interpret for your client. So you started off by talking about the importance of reducing costs and cutting processes. And I was going to ask you about you know, specific examples of that. You did actually touch on meta descriptions. Um, so why are meta descriptions not an efficient use of time at the moment? And what's an example of another process that perhaps costs too much and that that should be cut? Okay, so for meta descriptions, the problem is that normally I think it's one of those elements you can generate. I agree on generation for these elements because they are not ranking factors. And for the user, a short description is usually fine. If you have, you know, a meta description generated by a machine, usually it's okay. You are not going to do any damage on average. So it's a risk you can take and you don't need to waste much time. Another example of, I can say, overrated, uh, overpriced, task, I think is also when doing audits. Because uh, I, I love audits, I do a lot of them. But my main issue is that in some cases, you don't really need to do an audit every month or every two months. Because if you can take an action, if you can do anything based on those audits, then they're useless. It's just a list of facts or interesting trivia that you're not using. and I heard a lot about these cases from some people that contacted me where they have like six audits from different agencies or different, you know, service providers, but they still get no results. And I don't blame the audits. I blame, you know, the mindset because you should take action. And this is one example of where it's overpriced because you're paying for something that you are not using. Because if you have six audits, I think you are already going overboard. You should stop before and start practicing, start doing what they say, implement the changes. Just majoring on meta descriptions just for one more second, completely accept that it's not part of an algorithm, but it does impact click-through rate. So is it not important because it impacts click-through rate and is optimizing that not something that will actually potentially get you significantly more traffic? Yes, I mean, of course, it impacts CTR. But for instance, Google can rewrite them. I usually work Mm. with content. Well, I don't work with e-commerce. So I talk about content websites or, you know, focus just on B2C content. And usually Google is rewriting all of my meta descriptions. Like 80% of my meta descriptions or what they see online is rewritten. So I write them every time. 
because it, it takes 10 seconds, so I just do it. But it's not something so important I would do as the first task for a client or in getting paid for that stuff. It's something I would never do. And for, for my specific uh, examples, so content websites, I hardly see my meta descriptions or any meta description, even for competitors, getting picked, especially for listicles. You write the best meta description and Google uses the items as the description. So you don't get the description. I, I usually read 10, uh, item 1, uh, 9, item 2. So it's quite a, it's a little bit discomforting because, I mean, it's not even a ranking factor. Okay, it impacts CTR, but if Google is going to rewrite it anyway, I don't waste much, much time on it. And does a page title come under the same umbrella? Can, would you just automate the generation of a page title as well? No, I'm a big fan of manual work for title tags. Super big fan. Because, I mean, that's the quickest win I've, I, I know. I mean, usually, especially with product pages, even though I, I don't usually deal with them, but in my limited experience, I got some pages from position 90 to position 1 just because it was a super authoritative website, super important, and because the page title was totally off. So after some months, after I ch or even weeks after I change the title, you see big bumps. And that's why I always do the page title manually. But you can also do it with, you know, with some software. It's feasible, especially for e-commerce, because, I mean, even if I don't do it, I know, because I can tell someone to write, I don't know, 10,000 titles manually. It's impossible. But for instance, there are some apps or use cases. Uh, if you check Leafoot, where you can just, you know, generate a title based on something you input, and it's quite reliable. But for what they do, so content websites, usually, they already have good titles because it's good practice, especially for publishers, to use clickbait or to use some, you know, emotional words. So on average, they are good. But for if you have a product, if you're in e-commerce, there are owners that just put the brand. Like if you're selling, I don't know, Nike shoes 100, then the title tag is Nike shoes 100, which is bad compared to what you can do. Sorry, what was that resource you mentioned? It sounded something like Leafoot to me. Yeah, Leafoot. How how do you spell that? Uh, L. Double okay. E. Uh huh. Foot. Uh huh. Foot, as in the thing at the end yeah. of your leg. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so something to look up then. Okay, thank you. And beforehand to me, you also mentioned that you've replaced Google Sheets with something called Airtable. Yeah. W why have you done that? What, what, what productivity increase has that given you? Okay, so the problem with spreadsheets is that they are spreadsheets, so they shouldn't be used for other tasks, right? They are not databases by, by definition. Even though you, you got big companies or enterprises still using Excel or still storing data as CSVs, so it's not a problem, an SEO problem. It's in every part of the world, in every type of industry. It's quite common. Airtable is essentially a, a mix between spreadsheets and databases. So if you know nothing about databases, it's perfect. You are the tar you're, you're a potential customer. And I used it because it's easier to automate tasks. Right, so I can set that when someone finishes an article or when you tick something, person X gets an email or this happens, so via hooks. And it's actually easier because I can use this data, I mean, I can use these tables as a spreadsheet, as a big spreadsheet, okay? As a worksheet, actually. And then you can also get views. Views is like virtual tables, right? that you can visualize with a click. So for instance, let's say you have a spreadsheet where you have URL, title, status, like published, draft, assigned, whatever, edited. You can just create a Kanban, which is called a view, where you can just see the articles grouped by status, like they were cards. And it's easier to scheme. 
and it's also good in terms of product productivity because I was working on some content websites and my editors told me, wow, this saves a lot of time because it's actually faster to look for something and it's, the UI is actually even better. Plus they got automations, they got fast pivot tables, uh, so it's easier to see if you have clusters. And another fact, fact that is important is that you can use press sheets, even Google Sheets, whatever you want, to label your articles. What I mean is that when you are dealing with a content audit and you have a flat structure, which is often the case for what they do, okay, like example.com slash article name, okay, it's flat, there, there is no hierarchy. You, you, you can have an hard time to classify your articles. Like to say, this article belongs to this group because you, you have nothing in the URL, right? So you have to set up rules, like a regex. Yeah, you have to select some criteria. But since I don't like it, because it's prone to error and can be quite annoying for larger websites, I recommend to label uh, this data, like, uh, URL, title, you have this row, where you have URL, title, status, comments, whatever. And then you have another column where you can just pick a category, so the cluster, that article, or the clusters, it belongs to. So once you have this file, you can export it, merge it to Search Console or Analytics, and you can group by cluster, and you can you know measure clicks or queries by group instead. So this is a smarter approach because if you get the overview of a website, it doesn't mean anything. Like who cares about the CTR of the entire website? It's not actionable. But if you have groups, if you do this process, it saves you time. Okay, maybe a little bit more expensive. It depends on your team, but, but anyway, it saves you time. And you also get more insights if you're smart about it. And if you can put the right, pull off the right automation. I really like, you've mentioned labeling a couple of times. You started off by talking about labeling your data, and I was going to go back to that, but, but you, you, you re-emphasized it then. And I think that, um, you know, certainly for larger websites, it's, it's key because you probably will lose track on different pages, different posts, blog posts that are ranking for related keyword terms. And perhaps you're sabotaging your efforts because you're getting a, a blog post that may not convert ranking for a competitive keyword term when if you clustered your opportunities effectively, then perhaps you'd give yourself the opportunity to, to rank that higher converting page for that term. Is, is that the kind of benefit that you're thinking of from labeling? Yes. And also, I mean, it depends on the perspective. If it is your website, of course, it's your own benefit. But for a client as well, because it doesn't make any sense to audit a publisher, because publishers usually talk about every possible topic in the existence, and compare, I don't know, lifestyle to tech, or another totally different topic. Because they have different competition, different profitability, dif maybe, even, maybe even different audience, so it only makes sense to label them and to separate them. Also for Google, in terms of topicality, because of course, if I have a cluster of articles and they are quite close and they got penalized, something happened. But if you don't cluster, if you don't do this process of labeling your data or you know, reasoning by sections, then you don't know where it happened. You just know it happened, but you don't know how to pinpoint, to pinpoint it. You know, ah, okay, something happened, but where? So it's very simple, actually. It's basic, you can say data analysis. It's not impossible, but it's so simple that it's not a frequent topic because usually for content audits, uh, you don't read this stuff. You usually read the basic stuff like check clicks, check impressions, check Google Analytics. But for instance, I don't even check analytics usually. I just use SERP data or Search Console or Screaming Frog, yeah. So you shared what SEO should be doing in 2023. Now let's talk about what SEO shouldn't be doing. So what's something that's seductive in terms of time, but ultimately counterproductive? What's something that SEO shouldn't be doing in 2023? Okay, so if you mean in general, I think shiny tools, but that goes for every year. I mean, if you ask me next year, I will say the, the same thing. What's an example of a shiny tool? Okay, 
for instance, well, ChatGPT. Okay. I mean, it's a powerful tool. I use it every day for coding because I'm lazy. I don't want to use my brain for operations because the tool can do it for me and it's often better than what I can produce, I would say. But in terms of, you know, impact on the industry, I think that it's overrated for one reason, because we OpenAI already had these tasks. So many of us were already using those tasks that you can also do with ChatGPT. The model is better, of course, I mean, and there is better marketing. It's more about the brand now. But of course, it's, in my opinion, it's nothing innovative, especially for some websites. Of course, if you're an e-commerce or one of those websites, the potential for me is higher because there is more room for automation, way more room for automation. But if you're doing B2B, any B2B, like what's the value of producing, like of using AI compared to B2C? Because in some niches, you can generate documentation with AI. It's perfectly fine. No one complains. And it makes sense for the user because some content cannot be done by humans. Like programmatic content, you shouldn't do manually because of course it's, it's impossible. But uh, if you consider B2B, where that B2B is also harder for me compared to B2C, where you know the content is boring by de default, as many B2B marketers say, I mean, they say it. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I mean, of course, I don't think that AI is going to make you rich because you need unique research, a unique angle, I mean, point of view compared to competitors, especially in the, in, in the English markets. Competition is tougher. It's way harder. So you're not going to compete with copied pages. Because if you check, let's pick B2B SAS, one of the most competitive markets out there, okay? I mean, even if you look for super niche keywords, you will find Shopify, Capterra, or someone else ranking for them. So I'm quite sure that even if you put AI content to scale, you are not going to beat them in, term of, in terms of trust and brand. So while ChatGPT is good, because I think you should use it for some tasks, especially if you are into coding, if you want to cluster something and you don't want to code, ChatGPT is a very good ally. A lot of use cases, a lot of them. But for content generation, especially for B2B or you know, thought leadership, please don't. He said B2B content is boring by default, I think, listener. Uh, yes. You could say, Marco, <laughs> that this is a piece of B2B content, um, an SEO podcast. Surely this isn't boring. Uh, okay, but, but, but marketing is interesting. But let's say if you're talking about, I don't know, construction, like concrete, it's hard to make an article about concrete engineering interesting. It's very hard because... If, if you don't want to work in the industry, if you're not passionate about it, yes. Uh, yeah, but even so... Because engineers or these people may expect, you know, a prof very professional and cold language. Mm. Because if you if you get something wrong, your company may get sued. Like if you say durable, how much durable? What do you mean by durable? Do you have a number to quantify durable? It's not so easy. Eh? And that's a conversation that we can probably carry on having in another episode, hopefully in the future. But at the moment, I'm just going to say that Marco Giordano is a freelance SEO and search engine optimization specialist and web analyst at Sika. You can also find him at Sika.com and of course on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Marco, thanks so much for adding your additional insight to SEO in 2023. Thanks for having me. I've been your host, David Bain. And you've been listening to SEO in 2023 Additional Insights, a majestic series that complements the original SEO in 2023 podcast, video series, and book. Find out more over at seoin2023.com.